All right. Yeah. Um, why was he banned from teaching uh, about religion? Yeah. He. Well, it, some of this is alluded in the presentation, which is that he had some controversial views about religion. Um, there's a little allusion to this even in our own text, where he talks about there's potential conflict between knowledge and religion. And one way that he's interpreted as dealing with this is essentially saying religion has its own sphere of knowledge, and then reason has its own sphere of understanding, but the two don't really relate to one another. <coughs> and some people, so some people love that, some people hated it. And the king at the time hated it. So, um, yeah. Um, are there any other questions about stuff about his life or anything else that I may have missed? Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Prussia at the time, that was a Protestant state, it wasn't Catholic. That's right. Okay. He's Lutheran, uh, and very devout Lutheran. Yeah, I wonder what a Catholic would say about his <laughs> religious ideas. Yeah. Um, you know, his, I will say that his thinking has deeply influenced both Catholic and Protestant the theology. Um, and not so much what I just said there, although to some extent. It's actually the stuff we're kind of doing today, which is, I mean, his general framework of epistemology has deeply influenced theology. It's really interesting. I mean, of all the philosophers we've studied in this period, Descartes could give Kant a run for his money on this, it, on this issue, but Kant pretty much hands down is the most influential thinker, period. He influenced everything. Whereas all these other guys up here, they've influenced a lot of things, right? I mean, Locke, who can, I mean, he gave us democracy, right? I mean, democracy, that's pretty important, right? American government, that's pretty big. Um, Leibniz, you know, calculus, that's pretty important in mathematics. You know, Descartes gives us Cartesian coordinates in mathematics. He's given us a bunch of other things that are relevant to science and math and philosophy. But Kant does it all. There's not a single area of major area of philosophy that Kant is not like one of the most important, his writings are not among the most important writings. Whether it's philosophy of like beauty, music, philosophy like science, philosophy of epistemology, mind, free will, he's done it all. <laughs> um, Ethics is a really big one. If you had most, if any of you are familiar with Kant prior to coming in here, it was probably because you read a little bit of his ethics. Um, so Kant is a really big deal. Um, I also want to say before I get too deep into our presentation, just that you should be very proud of yourselves being where you are at this point in the semester. You have read a lot of really hard philosophy. <coughs> and you've traced through some of the most, I would say some of the most interesting thinkers in Western Europe. Um, and you've seen a nice little conversation, if you will, started with Descartes. So Descartes tries to start us off by convincing us of innate ideas, thinking that some kind of pure rationalism is the basis for all of our thoughts and ideas and knowledge. Leibniz kind of continues in that tradition, but in a very different way. Leibniz thinks it's all ideas, but he thinks reality is also all ideas. Um, that the physical world is a kind of illusion. Then we turn to Locke, and Locke totally turned against all that. And Locke said, everything is through experience. And he wanted to say there's a difference between the substances and their primary qualities that really exist, and then your secondary, the secondary qualities and the things that exist in your mind that represent them. Um, then Barclay came along and said, you can't do that, you can't separate the two, you only can have ideas in the mind. And then Hume comes along and basically says you can't have any knowledge of anything. So here we come to Kant, and he's going to try to respond in a way to what Hume was doing. Not a lot of people read Hume, or took Hume very seriously. Kant read Hume and said, that's a serious problem. We got to do. We have to come up with an answer to that. So, the critique of pure reason was the first edition was 1781. There was a second edition that was published in 1787. Um, if you notice in your book, there's these marginal notes about a page numbers with like A and B. A 
corresponds to the first edition, B to the second edition. Um, they're not. I don't see a huge difference in the first and second edition. Uh, but I'm no. I'm not a Kant expert. Um, but I, I just see the second edition as sort of expanding and <laughs> further explaining the key ideas he already put in there. What we're going to be looking for is how he puts forward this revolutionary view of epistemology or knowledge. Um, in our reading, one of the things is going to be the focus on reason or thought itself. This is one of the key parts of what we're doing in this class, is trying to understand what thinking or thought is in itself. He's not going to argue for there being innate ideas, but rather something more like what we'll call innate categories. And this will make more sense at the end. And finally, he's going to, the unique part of his uh, approach is including a role for what is called synthetic a priori knowledge. Once again, that'll be clearer as we get through the, all of this tonight. So, to start us off, let's talk about what does he mean by conducting a critique of pure reason. So, let's open up to page 718. Um, I want to start reading the second line from the top on the left column. And as we read this, he's going to be telling us about what is a critique of pure reason. And let's just kind of see what you take from this. So he says, um, all right. It is a call to reason to take on once again the most difficult of all its tasks, namely that of self cognition and to set up a tribunal that will make reason secure in its rightful claims and will dismiss all baseless pretensions, not by fiat, but in accordance with reason's eternal and immutable laws. This tribunal is none other than the critique of pure reason itself. By critique of pure reason, however, I do not mean a critique of books and systems, but I mean the critique of our faculty of reason as such, in regard to all cognitions after which reasons may strive independently of all experience. Hence I mean by it the decision as to whether a metaphysics as such is possible or impossible, and the determination of its sources as well as its range and limits all on the basis of principles. There's a, actually a few different things you, you can take from this. What are some of the things that you see in that passage that he's telling us is the critique of pure reason? one of the key things from the whole thing you should take. What else do you take from this? What else are we going to be getting at when we talk about a critique of pure reason? Yeah. Well, I kind of like interpret it as it seems like he was kind of talking about like instincts kind of, like you don't have to have to experience them before you just like kind of know like what you're supposed to do kind of thing. Yeah, there's a kind of immediate nature of these things. Um, and that's brought out in some of the other passages as well, but it's not... There's sort of a, a, a process you have to go through to understand what they are, but they operate immediately. Here are a few things I came up with. Um, it's the study of self-cognition. 
how thinking itself works. Not how, so once again, not how your thought, he doesn't want you to analyze like the thought of a chair, or the thought of a tree, or the thought of love, or the thought of God. He wants you to think, it's like thinking about thought. Period. So it's trying to understand what thought is in and of itself. Um, we're going to be looking at reasons, what he calls eternal and immutable laws. To know reason as it is, independent of all experience. And one of the things that comes out from this um, is whether or not metaphysics is possible. The, the thing that we get from Hume is that basically all attempts to know anything is impossible. That Hume says it's in, because of the inability to reason on the basis of cause and effect, that trying to make any kind of inference to anything outside of your mind is impossible, and metaphysics would be included in that. So he's trying, if he's, he's trying to fix the problem that Hume gave us, and but thereby show, hopefully, that metaphysics is something that's possible. Trying to understand the way the world really is is something we can actually do. Any questions about this? <clears throat> Another way to kind of understand what he's doing in the critique of pure reason is to look at this analogy he gives on 721 where he compares himself quite modestly to Copernicus. Um, anybody who goes around saying that they are like Copernicus is not being modest. Um, so, you know, you know how Copernicus was, right? Copernicus was trying to give us an answer to really strange phenomena in the sky. Um, we are starting, we are coming up with solar system models and the assumption was always that the Earth was the center of our solar system. But it, you got really weird things, like they're trying to track the motion of Mars or Venus or a lot of the planets in our solar system. You'll notice that it doesn't just go across the, the night sky in a nice, even, straight line like you would expect if the Earth was the center of the universe. What, is, what happens? Mars kind of goes, and then it comes back, and then it keeps going, and then it comes back. Like, that's really weird. Why would Mars do that if the Earth is the center of the universe? Now, there were lots of scientists who gave very accurate mathematical models that explained the motions of these other planets and why they go around, like they thought that essentially the Earth was the center and then Ma Mars must just be sort of doing, you know, circles around circles around us. And you can model it that way, right? Copernicus came up with this revolutionary idea and said maybe the Earth, after all, isn't the center of our solar system. What if the Sun is and we're all going around the Sun? That would explain in a much simpler way all the motions of these planets. We don't have to come up with these curly Q rotations. We can get, they were called epicycles. We can just explain them with, you know, nice, somewhat circular orbits. So by changing our orientation around one problem, we we're able to solve uh, something that seemed very complex with simplicity. In the same way, Kant is trying to do, he is very self-consciously comparing himself to Copernicus and saying, let me revolutionize the way, change our orientation here. We change our orientation about epistemology, our theory of knowledge. Then, maybe we'll get amazing and better results just like Copernicus did with the solar system. So he says, thus far it has been assumed that all our cognition, like all of our thought, must conform to objects. So I think, before I go on here, what he means by that is, like everybody we have read up till now, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, have said if we're going to have knowledge of the world, the way it works is essentially that your mind has to change and represent the way the world is. And if your mind doesn't change in the right way, if your mind doesn't represent the world as it actually is, well then you fail to have knowledge. So thus far it's been assumed that all of our thoughts have to conform to objects that are external to us, otherwise we can't have knowledge. Then he says, on that presupposition, however, all our attempts to establish something about them a priori, and a priori, maybe as a starter, we can say that just means apart from experience, 
All of our attempts to establish something about them a priori by means of concepts through which our cognition <coughs> would be expanded have come to nothing. In other words, on this kind of approach where we have to say that in order to have knowledge of the world, our minds have to conform to the way the world is, we can't know much. We haven't been very successful. Let us, therefore, try to find out whether we shall not make better progress in the problems of metaphysics if we assume, here's the, the game changer, that objects must conform to our cognition. In other words, what if the world has to conform to the way we think? All this time we've been thinking our minds had to conform to the way the world is in and of itself. But what if the world has to change to be a certain way to make it to meet our minds? In other words, what if our minds shape the way the world is? If that's true, then we are able to have some kind of a priori means of understanding the way the world is, because the world would have to fit into certain structures of our mind. So, in this way, it makes possible greater knowledge. It overcomes certain kinds of skeptical concerns. The skeptical concern is, how do you know that your mind is actually matching up with the way the world is? His solution is to say, aha! The world has to change in order to meet to be adequate for our minds. That your mind plays some role in shaping reality. So that's his Copernican revolution. Stop thinking that you have to that your mind has to passively receive the world and change in order to make to to represent reality accurately. Oh no. Your mind is actively involved in making the world the way it is, and for that reason, you can know the way the world is. Well, I have more to say about this, but I'm, I just want to make sure that I'm impressing upon you the significance of this shift. Another thing to think about is the way his, his philosophy is often called transcendental idealism. And I'm not going to read all this, but if you you can find some of these ideas where I've marked up here, 722, 723. It's transcendental in the sense that all thought involves a kind of a priori intuition. A priori, once again, meaning apart from experience. So he's going to say every thought that you have relies on some kind of addition that the mind adds to it that your mind is supplying something that makes thought possible about things. We'll see about this. This is, at its most fundamental level, are two things that your mind supplies, space and time. I'll have a little bit more to say about those in, later tonight. Um, so it's transcendental in the sense that thought involves this a priori intuition, that all thought involves an addition a substantive and real addition that your mind gives it. The second part of this is the idealism. It's a dangerous word we've seen associated with Leibniz and with Barclay. His idealism is different from theirs, thank goodness. That he is not saying that all reality is ideas. What he's saying is that all, all, the only thing we can know are ideas but he believes that there is a world external to our world of ideas. So the only thing that we can think about, the only objects of thought, are what he calls phenomena, or appearances, or objects of experience. Those things are what we can know. Those are the things that we can think about. Knowledge of what he calls things in themselves, or a thing in itself, um, or the noumena, which is the way things exist apart from thought, that is impossible. Because when you're, for Kant, when you're, you're asking him to think about what is the, the way reality is apart from thought, 
That's impossible to think about because the only way you can think about it is through thought. The difference, though, is that unlike Barclay took that lesson to mean, therefore, there is nothing apart from thought. Kant believes there is a reality apart from thought. It's just that the reality is not something that we can ever know. So in that sense, he's an idealist in that all you can know are thoughts. Questions about what he means, what we're, we mean by a transcendental idealism. Kant is one of these philosophers, by the way, it makes so much more sense after we get everything out on the table. So, in some ways, after I've talked about all this, and we get to the very end of the class, it'll make more sense how this all comes together at once. It's almost like you need everything explained all at once, which, of course, we can't do. All right, this gets us to this next topic, the synthetic a priori. Um, before we can talk about synthetic a priori knowledge, we need to talk about the difference between synthetic, what synthetic means, what a priori means. So let's first talk about a priori. There are two categories of judgments, a priori judgments, a posteriori judgments. A priori judgments are those that are supposed to involve necessity and universality. So these kinds of claims. All triangles have three sides. All red things are colored things. These are a priori judgments because these are things that we think are necessarily true, meaning they couldn't be have any other truth value than being true. And secondly, that they are universal, meaning that there's no exceptions to them. Um, so all triangles have three sides. It's necessarily and universally true. All red things are colored things. It's necessarily and universally true. And a posteriori judgments then do not have necessity and universality. So a claim like my shirt is blue, or if I was tailoring it to today, my shirt is white, that there's nothing necessary or universal about such a claim. It could change. Is that all right? Question about a priori, a posteriori? So the next distinction is between analytic and synthetic. Um, let's take a look on page 724. Um, on the right column here, I want to take a look um, right under Roman numeral 4 there. I'm going to read a little bit, and the question to think about as I'm reading is, what is the difference between analytic and synthetic claims? In all judgments in which we think the relation of a subject to the predicate, I here consider affirmative judgments only because the application of negative judgments af uh, afterwards is easy. This relation is possible in two ways. Either the predicate B belongs to the subject A as something that is covertly contained in this concept A, or B, though connected with concept A, lies quite outside it. In the first case, I call the judgment analytic, in the second, synthetic. Hence, affirmative analytic judgments are those in which the predicate's connection with the subject is thought by identity, whereas those judgments in which this connection is not thought with identity are to be called synthetic. Analytic judgments could also be called explicative, for they do not add anything to the concept of subject through the predicate, rather they only dissect the concept, breaking it up into its component concepts which, already, which had already been thought in it, although thought confusedly. Synthetic judgments, on the other hand, could be called expansive. For they do not add to the con for they do add to the concept of the subject a predicate that had not been thought in that concept at all and could not have been extracted by it by any dis dissection. So what's the difference in the two? Yeah. Is it kind of like analytic is it is what it is kind of thing? It's very almost cut and dry in so many words, and then synthetic is kind of how you 
your mind digests it and um, breaks it down into into different things. It's kind of like more broken down and not as straight and cut forward. Some of those things would apply. I'd look, okay. In other words, I'm a little more specific. That's not bad. I, I want to say that if it's analytic, just by understanding, I guess, the nature of what you're talking about is, then what your whatever your B is follows from the understanding of it directly. But that doesn't necessarily happen with synthetic. You may have to know additional information about it. That's a good way to put it. That's a little more abstract. So my, the classic example of an analytic claim is one like, a, bach a bachelor is unmarried. The concept of a bachelor contains within it the concept of being unmarried. So if you understand what it means to be a bachelor, then you know that whatever a bachelor is, is also unmarried. Because b being unmarried is contained under the concept of being a bachelor. Um, whereas if I were to say a bachelor, bachelors are less than 10 feet tall, that's a synthetic claim, because being less than 10 feet tall is not part of the concept of being a bachelor. Wouldn't like synthetic judgment be like more of how you perceive things, how like everyone perceives things? This is traditionally what's been thought. So this is what everybody thought before Kant. Um, I'm getting excited here. Um, <laughs> analytic claims are, so let me get this up because I'm ready to move to the next slide. Is, the predicate is, is contained in the subject. So like all bachelors are unmarried. Why is that analytic? Because being unmarried is a concept contained in being a bachelor. Um, all bodies are extended. That is analytic because what it means to be a body, to have a physical object, is to be to have extension. But a synthetic judgment would be where the predicate is connected to the subject. The two like if it's a true judgment then the predicate is actually connected to the subject, but it is not contained within it. <coughs> so all bachelors are shorter than eight feet tall. That might be true. I might have to raise the height up to account for some people. But let's say all bachelors are shorter than 11 feet tall. That's probably true. Um, it's a synthetic judgment because being less than eight, eight feet tall, being less than 11 feet tall, is not included in the concept of being a bachelor. And Kant's example is, all bodies are heavy. It might be true, actually, it, there's a sense in which this isn't true, but that bodies are heavy, but it's not because of what the nature of what a body is. Um, to be a body is just to be an extended thing. If you take, of course, an extended thing up into space, it no longer has any weight. So it wouldn't be true that all bodies are heavy. Now, to bring it all together where Sarah was going, prior to Kant, the big assumption was that there were only two kinds of truths, analytic a priori truths and synthetic a posteriori truths. Like, it seems like the two categories just lined up with one another. So that, remember our good friend Leibniz and his truths of reason, or Hume and his relations of ideas? That was just an analytic a priori truth. Those would be things that are just true by definition. And once again, all bachelors are unmarried does the trick. Or all red things are colored things does the trick. That's just a matter of understanding the concepts involved tells you what they are. Um, Kant tells us these do not expand our knowledge. All they do at best is clarify maybe <coughs> confused or, or ideas we had about these things before or they show us more clearly what the, the knowledge we already have is, but it doesn't really give us new knowledge in any way. So if I know that Travis is a bachelor, and then I deduce from that, therefore Travis is unmarried, I already knew that when I knew he was a bachelor. Um, on the other side of this was the synthetic a posteriori truths. Leibniz's truths of fact or Hume's matters of fact. These were thought to be expansive or informative kinds of claims. They tell us more, like this would be the claim, uh, this would be like just the claim that Travis is a bachelor. That is informative. It's not part of the na nature of Travis to be a bachelor. It's not part of the nature of a bachelor to contain Travis. So when I learned that, that's something brand new that I couldn't have deduced just by thinking about the concepts involved. Um, 
So here's another assumption that was going on prior to Kant is this idea that the mind is just passive in our, in our way of obtaining knowledge about the world. That, and you see this, if you think of that with Descartes, with Locke, with Berkeley, they all talked about one way you can know that the world is, object, that our knowledge of the world is real, is when that knowledge comes to you sort of passively, when, you, when it impacts you. So it almost makes the mind, when you're experiencing external objects like trees, chairs, other people, and so on, as if your mind just does nothing and, but receives all the information. Kant is going to reject this claim as well. He's going to argue that in our observations of, of external objects, then in those kinds of perceptions, the mind is active. The mind does something. It's not just a passive receptacle, it's actively involved in making that perception what it is. And then thirdly, we've seen that knowledge all comes from one basic source, depending on who we're talking about, right? Descartes and Leibniz would say reason, uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume would all say experience. And there's a sense in which what Kant is saying is actually it's both at the same time. Although there's another sense in which you could take Kant as basically saying it's both at the same time, but it's also really reason. Um, now, as I was saying, if Hume is correct about the way that we think about knowledge, then any knowledge <coughs> of anything beyond one's immediate perceptions is impossible. And that's because there is no way to establish reasoning based on induction or cause and effect. So, what, one thing to take from this is that maybe if you buy one, two, and three, what Hume is saying follows. What Kant is going to be doing is by overturning one, two, and three on the board here, he's essentially also saying this is why Hume is wrong and we are capable of having greater knowledge than just what's, uh, what's immediately before us. So, the exciting new category, as you can see by the title of the slide, is, is to combine synthetic knowledge with a priori knowledge. So, the way to solve Hume's problem is to recognize that there is a third possibility, a third kind of truth. A truth that is a synthetic, meaning that it's informative, it's expansive, it brings together things that are not true just by definition and it's a priori, which means that it is, once again, not based on experience. It's something that the mind contains within itself. That it is um, something that tells us what is necessarily and universally true about the world. And this is what will make possible refuting skepticism and gives us a basis for now doing metaphysics that was all destroyed by Hume. So our synthetic a priori knowledge for Hume is our knight in shining armor. Why? Because, because, it is, because it's both synthetic and it's a priori. It's synthetic, like I said, because it gives us informative new information, but it's also a priori. It's something that we don't have to find in experience. It's something that the mind already contains within itself. So, but one way to look at what Hume did is he showed that we can't find anything else. Than, if you just look at what's given to us in experience, you can't figure out all sorts of things. Kant is going to argue, but we do, Hume was looking too strictly at experience. If you, look, if you look at reasoning more generally, or in a more fundamental way, you'll see that we do have the means to make those inferences. So, here's one that's in response to Hume. We didn't quite go over this aspect of Hume, but it was kind of implied in what we had already read. Hume wants to know, where do you get your idea of cause and effect? So this is kind of different than what we actually, what our chapter, the, the thing that we stopped with. We kept reading, we'd go into this. Hume says, 
you have, essentially, you have no real idea of cause and effect. You just have the idea that one thing is constantly joined, followed by another thing. That there's what he calls constant conjunction. So like if I strike a match and a fire is lit, and I say, did you observe cause and effect? A lot of you might say, yeah, I just saw cause and effect. Hume would say, no, you didn't. You just saw one event, a match being struck, and followed by a second event, a fire being uh, ignited. But where's the cause and effect? Show me, where was that in your experience? Um, if you, you know, if I take a bottle of perfume and I spray it in the room, and then the room smells nice, which is a much nicer example than another smell example I was going to give, then you say, I say the perfume caused the pleasant smell. And I say, did you observe the cause and effect? Hume would say, no, you don't. You just observed one event, the spraying, followed by another event, the smell. But you don't observe the causation. Causation is not in your experience. Kant wants to say that we do actually have an idea of causation. Hume was right that we don't get the idea from experience. But we do have this idea. Um, so he gives an example. He says, here's something we all know. We all know that everything that happens has a cause. So think about this. If all of a sudden the roof collapsed, thankfully none of us were hurt, would any of you turn around and just say, well, there's no reason for that. Sometimes roofs collapse and there was no basis for it. Or would you turn around and say, there must have been like some construction problems or damage done or something that caused the roof to weaken so that it falls. I would venture to wager, all of you would say, that the first thing is just absolutely crazy. It's the second thing that makes sense. There's a reason why roofs collapse. They don't just collapse for no reason. If you go out to your car and it doesn't start, you don't think, well, you know, things just take place and there's no cause or no, no basis for why stuff happens sometimes. You go out and you turn your key and it just goes rrr, 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 and never turns over. Your response is, there must be some reason for this. Is the battery dead? Is the fuel, you know, is the, the am I out of gas? Did, you know, is there something, some other mechanical problem with the starter? Um, am I in the right car? Those would be all the kinds of questions you'd be asking, right? Um, you we all understand that everything happens has a cause. And we bring that to experience. Experience, so here's sort of a, a taste of what Kant is doing. We don't learn this proposition through experience. Hume, you know, that's, that's something Hume got right. We don't get it from experience. We bring it instead, Kant would say, to experience. The way that we understand experience is on the presupposition that we already get that everything that happens has a cause. Here's another example of a synthetic a priori uh, knowledge. And a controversial one, but it's Kant's favorite. So 7 plus 5 equals 12. Kant thinks that mathematics, pretty much all mathematics, is synthetic a priori knowledge. Why? Because the concept of the union of 7 and 5 does not contain within it the concept of 12. But we can all do 7 plus 5 equals 12. Even before, even you know, apart from the... <coughs> we learn, we can understand this a priori truth that the joining of seven things and the joining of five things yields this new concept of twelveness. And twelve, the concept of twelve is not contained within seven and five, or the union of seven and five. So every time you do a mathematics, every time you do even basic addition, that involves synthetic a priori knowledge. Um, and Kant says this might be more evident as you use larger numbers. 
Because sometimes, this is what some people think, is that when you think of the union of seven and five, you're thinking of like seven dots and five dots. And if you really, and then you kind of like, the seven dots are here and the five dots are here. So you put them together, you put them together, and then the seven, make 12 dots, right? So you might think the union of seven and five really do make 12. But think about this. Now do a simple mathematic, mathematical addition, like 100 plus 200 you get 300. Do you think of 100 dots and 200 dots and the joining of those together gives you 300 dots? No, that's not how we do that. You grasp, the, you grasp that mathematical truth without some kind of representation like that. It's the joining of these concepts in a different way. Um, so, Kant would say, by doing mathematics, we're arriving at new knowledge. That, w And maybe there's some, some people might be able to attest to something like this. The first time you start doing mathematics, you might even be sort of surprised to discover certain things add up to, to being certain numbers. Um, like, you're sort of surprised, wow, 7 plus 5 is, oh my gosh, it's 12. Amazing. The only way that you could have that reaction is if 12 was not contained in the concept of 7 plus 5. Questions about this? Does this make sense, or am I just going on like a crazy person? I don't have the reaction. <laughs> Which reaction? It's like I'm surprised that I, it's usually after I do it, it becomes like just like self-evident. Now, Kant's cool with that. Like, he definitely wants to say there's some kind of self-evident and necessary aspect to this as well. Think, and maybe to have that surprise, that sort of like, oh, wow, it's actually this sum, maybe that involves, like, when you're younger, when you first do it. Maybe the problem is that you're so accustomed to doing it now that it's like a second nature. Just in the same way as, like, right now, you're not really surprised to discover that, like, Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. But maybe, like, a young child, the first time they learn that, it is surprising. Or there is sort of like, you know, if like they have an aunt or an uncle who lives there, they're like, oh, that's where my, you know, how cool. I don't know. <laughs> Not a lot rides on that intuition. It's more on, the bigger one is whether you think the concept of 12 is contained in the concept of 7 plus 5. So far, though, you, this example, everything that happens as a cause does tell us about the world. So that would be synthetic a priori knowledge about reality. This example of 7 plus 5 equals 12, maybe you don't think is that informative about the way the world works. Um, so, well, let me hold off on this before I get to some of the other examples. So if Kant is right about the reality of synthetic a priori knowledge, it follows then that Leibniz and Hume are wrong about the way we acquire knowledge. So Leibniz thought that all knowledge could be established through logical deduction. He thought everything could be established using a priori analytic reasoning. Hume thought skepticism was true because we cannot establish knowledge based on cause and effect through reason, analytic a priori knowledge, or experience, synthetic a posteriori knowledge. If there is this third category that nobody has explored, then this would show that there is the possibility of having real metaphysical knowledge, of extending our knowledge beyond the narrow scope of experience. Let me pause for a moment before we talk about space and time. Just ask, is there any, are there any questions about synthetic a priori knowledge and what role it's playing? It'll be a little bit more clear how, after we do the space and time bit, it's going to be a little more clear how this plays a role in our knowledge of the world. Um, the cause and effect example might be a good one to think about for now. Our understanding of cause and effect is a synthetic a priori knowledge. It is an example of synthetic a priori knowledge. It's the way in which we're able to, it's, a presupposition that we bring to experience. It's how experience actually is in, it works. It's the way that experience is not just a blur of ideas, but 
but ma- we manage to do something intelligible with experience. <coughs> so you don't learn cause and effect, or all causes, all, 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 all events, everything that happens has a cause. It's rather you already understand that, and that's why when things happen in the world, we're able to reason about it in certain ways. So let's talk about space and time. Um, two things that we want to try to, to establish, what Kant wants to establish with space and time. First, we want to show that space and time constitute what he calls the sensible forms of experience. What does he mean by that? It's like the framework by which experience takes place. The framework in which we have experience. And secondly, to show that space and time are not features of reality, but are only forms of sensibility. In other words, to use the, what we talked about earlier, those categories of thinking, that space and time are realities for the phenomena, but they're not realities of the noumena, or the way the world is in itself. They are only, space and time only apply to the world of appearances, the world of thought and experience. Now, to contrast Kant, maybe it's helpful to compare him to two other very prominent views of space and time, Leibniz and Newton. Newton thought that space and time exist in a real, absolute, and necessary way. That space and time do not depend on the existence of humans. So, I mean, like, Newton thought that space, like the, the, the world having a three-dimensional space and ex- is extended infinitely is necessarily true. And that uh, you know, space is this way whether we think about it or not. So the reality, uh, the objective reality of space and time does not depend on us in any way. <coughs> Leibniz, on sort of the complete other end of this, thought that space and time are constructions of human perceptions. That he doesn't think there's, that the world really has space or time in it, that it's really just a measure of the subjective experiences that we have of particular things. Um, and this is all related to, if you think back to the monadology and, and what he was saying about monads, that space, um, that the physical objects aren't in a sense, real, that they're more like these real appearances, or these nice illusions like rainbows. Um, In the same way, space and time, they're only real insofar as they're helpful as constructions to understanding our experiences. But not really. If we didn't exist, there'd be no space and time. Kant is going to have sort of a middle view between these two. Questions about what I'm saying about Newton or Leibniz? I'm going to try, and you'll see in a few more of these slides, not just in space and time, but with the final wrap-up of this. I'm trying to help you see Kant in terms of how he compares to a lot of these other thinkers. I hope that comparisons make it clear what his view is. So he's not like Newton or Leibniz. So here are a bunch of quotes about space and time from our text. And all I did is find, like, I mean, when I have these numbered, one, two, three, four, if you look on these pages, I mean, he literally just numbers these, number one, two, three, four. And I, you'll notice a parallelism between one and two and what um, four and five for space correspond, sorry, three and four for space correspond to four and five for time. Time is a little different in the third thing in that time, time is different than space in one important aspect. Space for Kant is, is something that only applies to our thoughts about like spa- like physical objects. Re- whenever you have to represent reality, like the external reality, the reality of a physical world, you need to have space. But if you just want to think about thoughts, like if you just, you know, if you just want to think about like a unicorn, well, even, forget it, you, know, you want to think about like virtue, something that's not physical. Just think about virtue. You don't need space to represent virtue. You just can think about the concept. 
but you still need the passage of time. You can't think about virtue without there being some temporal component to your thought. Let me go through a couple of these things. I'm not necessarily going to cover it, all of this, um, but let's just take a look at the first one. Space is not an empirical concept that has been abstracted from outer experiences. Notice time this is the same. Time is not an empirical concept that has been extracted from any experience. Kant is saying that you don't have an experience of space. Or you don't have an experience of time itself. What you have an experience of are physical objects within the framework of space, but every you, know, you can't find space itself in your experience. So that you can't like deter you can't see what space is, you only see things that are already in space. Likewise, you don't experience time itself you experience the passage of time through events. But once again, you don't get that direct, immediate understanding of time. Um, he says that space is a necessary a priori rep representation that underlies all outer intuitions. And likewise, time is a necessary representation that underlies all, not just the outer intuitions, but all intuitions. Once again, space and time are not things that we b learn from experience. It's not like you get the concepts of space and time from experience. The way Kant thinks about it is that space and time are something that your mind already, like the way he will put it later, these are categories of thought that your mind already has. Your mind, you're not born with innate knowledge, according to Kant. What you're born with are innate categories for understanding things. So you're born, when you're not born with the idea of space, but your mind is born, when you're born, your mind is already equipped with the capacity such that when you have experiences, to fill those experiences with space and time. You don't get space and time from experience. It's almost the other way around. Experiences get their reality from your mind supplying space and time to them. Um, I was going to skip over the rest of these for the time being, but the, that, the same kind of point that he's getting at is that space and time are something that our minds, they're not found in experience. It is something our mind supplies about experience. And furthermore, um, space and time have the structures that they have necessarily. They couldn't be different in any other way. And that's important for Kant. Because when he says that your mind supplies these ideas, he doesn't mean to say, therefore, it's illusory or therefore we can't know reality, his point is that rather the opposite. Since your mind supplies these, this necessary framework for knowledge, that's how we can know things for certain. That's actually how we are able to have knowledge of things. And then he draws these conclusions. Once again, direct quotes from your text, the A, B, and C, are things, one thing, that are directly found in the text itself here. So I'm just kind of highlighting some parallels he's drawing about space and time. So he says about space, that space represents no property whatsoever of any things in themselves, nor does it represent things in themselves in their relation to one another. Time is not something that is self-subsistent or that attaches to things as an objective determination and that hence would remain one abstracted from all subjective conditions of our intuitions of it. Both of those things are saying essentially this. Space and time are not aspects of reality apart from our thoughts. Space and time are only things that apply to what our thought, to what we are thinking about. Space, he says, is nothing by the mere form of all appearances of outer senses. It is the subjective condition of sensibility under which alone outer intuition is possible for us. And time is nothing but the form of inner sense, of the intuiting we do of ourselves and of our inner state. 
Um, and then time is different from space in that it is the a priori condition for all thought, all appearances. Whereas space, once again, is just about visual experience, physical representation. Um, here's a summary here. Space and time are a priori intuitions. They are a priori because they are not derived from experience. Once again, you don't have an experience of space. You have a, an experience of objects that fill space. But you don't have... Nothing in your experience is space itself. Same thing goes for time. Your concept that you don't have an experience of time itself, what you have are, is, are experiences of events that flow through time. So our knowledge of space and time can't be derived from experience. Therefore, they must be um, a priori. There must be something innate within us. But not innate like an idea. Once again, innate like a, categor like a way to categorize thought or a way to in understand thought. And they are also called intuitions because we have an immediate, non-conceptual awareness of them. Um, which means that, that these are things that are... That we, that we have in thought, but not because we reason about them or because we conceptualize them. Once again, it's like there are prerequisites for us being able to conceptualize and think about other things. So, how is this different from Newton and Leibniz? Space and time are not reducible to our experience contrary to Leibniz. Leibniz would say that space and time don't have any objective reality to them, and they could be different than what we think about them. If we thought about them differently, space and time would be different. Kant is saying, no, space and time have a necessary structure that um, is not just reducible to the relations of things in our experiences. And therefore, there is something objective and real about space and time, contrary to Leibniz. However, unlike Newton, he's also saying that space and time are not real in an absolute sense, meaning that they don't apply to things outside of the way we think about them. They only exist in our minds as they are attached to things we think about, to subjects. So space and time are necessary prerequisites to have perceptions and thoughts about objects. If you think, this is another way to think about what he's doing here. Can you imagine having thoughts about things Without, there being, without them being in space or time. Like, could you imagine a table? Like, can you think about the table apart from space and time? The answer seems to be no. If I think about a table, it's got to be spatially represented and there's a flow of time as I'm thinking about it. I can't, I can't form a thought about the table independent of space or time. So for any kind of representation of the world, you can't do that representation apart from space and time. And then for any thought period in general, you can't have thoughts without there being time. All of your ways of thinking involve the flow of time to them. You can't take that away. Hence, space and time are not things you learn from experience. Space and time are things that you already need to have in your mind in order to have experiences, or to understand them, or to think about them. How does that, does that make a little bit of sense about what I'm saying about your mind shaping the world now? Your mind comes equipped with the categorization of space and time. If your mind didn't already have the, that way of categorizing thought, then when you have these experiences of like tables, desks, chairs, and other people, it would just be this mess of information that your mind, if your mind did nothing but receive the information, your mind wouldn't know what to do with that. All, it would just be this blur of information coming in. What, he's, what Kant is saying is your mind isn't just passively receiving the information from your senses. It's that when your senses bring all this stuff into your mind, your mind now has within itself this way of organizing, categorizing, and understanding, sort of 
ordering all the experiences that you are having so that they are intelligible, so that you're capable of thinking about it. Because all the stuff that's being brought to you through experience isn't enough by itself. There must be something additionally brought to those experiences that help, enables you to think about it. We'll have more to say about what I, that little bit I just did, but that's me trying to tie all this together here. Are there questions about his views of space and time? Yeah, when he says that, like, that, like um, you can't get the idea of time through, like, experience or, like, empiricism, like, I know there have been times in my life where I, like, when I went to sleep, I closed my eyes, and it didn't seem like any time later, and I woke up and it was, like, like hours later. How can you explain that? Because clearly I, I used the, I got the evidence afterwards to know that there was time going on in that period. My mind didn't experience it. I don't know. So, like, are you saying kind of like where you, like, kind of nod off? You don't quite realize, when you wake up, you don't realize, like, hours have passed? No, like, I went to bed, and I, I felt like I closed my eyes, and then, like, it was, like, eight hours later. I think, this is what I might, in that case, of course, you're not experiencing the flow of time at all, in a way. And Kant would, so Kant, the cool thing about him is that he's not, he would say that you need to have experience. It's sort of, you need to have both the experience, the experience needs to be there for these categories of your mind to be put to work. So if you don't have any experiences, like if you fall asleep and like that, then your mind can't do anything. We're going to have to say more about that pretty soon. So you need to have the experiences plus the mind. In a way, he's kind of faulting people like Leibniz and Descartes because they put so much on the idea that the mind can do it on its own. He's going to say, no, the mind can't do it all on its own, but neither can experience do it all on its own either. You've got to have both. Okay. I was wondering if yeah. the only way I knew time had passed is when I like, looked at the clock and looked outside and, see, and saw that time had passed. I was just wondering how that fit into this. I think in that kind of case, it wouldn't be, like, he doesn't have anything unique to say about that. All, what he would say is more about the way that we feel the flow of time happening just like right now right. is different. Because, like, the empiricist would say you experience the flow of time. And what Kant would say is, you don't actually really experience the flow of time. What you experience, is, uh, what you're getting through it, immediate experience right now is just one event followed by another event followed by another. The flow of time is supplied by your mind that, that, sh that is the way of like making sense of all these experiences. It's the underlying presupposition in your thought, but it's not the object of thought. Other thoughts about space and time, wormholes, stargates. Let's take a little break here, and uh, we'll pick up when the old clock says uh, 7.30, let's say 7.33.